we find a high proportion of the population in the Middle East and North Africa. Just to mention the few countries uh, which are at the center of the movement now, Tunisia, it was close to 24%, so close to one quarter of the population below the uh, upper national poverty line. Syria, 30%. Uh, Morocco, close to 40%, 4-0. Egypt, 41%. And Yemen is the, the, the one, the, one of the poorest uh, spots in the region, 60%, or 60% population below the national, the upper national poverty line that is unable to meet, I mean, to, to uh, meet their needs in food and non-food, essential needs uh, in those levels. So there is poverty in the region despite the wrong idea that can come from the World Bank criteria and their $1 and $2 kind of, uh, of thresholds. And above that, as we know, poverty in and by itself is not uh, the explosive factor usually. It's always poverty combined with inequality. And inequality in the region is absolutely tremendous. We don't have any reliable figure on uh, um, inequality. The uh, existing data are just, some of them, ridiculous. According to World Bank figures, for instance, uh, the Gini index of, uh, of, uh, of Egypt is 0.3, uh, and uh, the 10% poorest Egyptians uh, compared to the 10% richest or those who have the highest consumption, the, the margin is, that is, is just seven, that is the highest 10% consume, according to these figures, only seven times what the lower 10% consume. This is completely ridiculous. Anyone knowing the figures uh, in the country will tell you that these figures are just, just a, a, a joke. So, there is a high, very high level of inequality. And of course, all this is related to, as I said, the, a kind of social and political structure that developed over the decades. One in which you have very high degrees of corruption. And it is related also to despotic forms of government. Corruption and despotism being at the center of all the rebellions, all the protest movements uh, uh, in the region. Uh, there's this form of crony, crony capitalism that has been developing over the last decades related with uh, despotic forms of government. And maybe some of you are familiar with discussions about the relation between corruption, dictatorship, and development. And if there is a region which is a, a, refuta a, a living refutation of any theory that dictatorship and corruption lead or can facilitate development, it's, the re it's this region, because there's a lot of corruption and despotism and there is no development. It's completely blocked and stalled uh, uh, development. <clears throat> and uh, I would, uh, speaking of despotism, uh, add that we have heard for several years and years and decades all sorts also of theories about the fact that despotism is cultural for Arabs or Muslims or whatever the theory. That, uh, you know, it's part of their culture. They are addicted, you know, like, uh, addicted to despotism. Well, I think that the ongoing events has proved beyond any possible discussion that there is no difference between Arabs uh, and the rest of the world when it comes to the fact of, be, of longing for, for democracy. And I'm sure that, like everybody, uh, we are all amazed by, the, for instance, the extraordinary courage displayed by the Syrians, the Syrian population, in, in, in you know, 
almost daily demonstrations and, and several people killed every day and, and continuing to fight in this demand for democracy and, uh, and freedom. Orientalist views have been dealt a very severe blow with the ongoing events. Now, <clears throat> these are the factors that uh, lie beneath this upheaval, that explain, that are at the roots of, uh, of this uh, ongoing upheaval. Because they are deep factors, deep roots, as you may expect, they didn't suddenly, I mean, the explosion is not a surprise in a sense. Any observer uh, was, I mean, any critical and serious person would have been expecting explosions in the region for many, many years. I keep saying the real question is not uh, uh, why did you have a social explosion, uh, but the real question is uh, why, why did it take so long to happen, actually? Because the expectation was there. And in a sense, we can be fooled by the media effect if we don't know more about the region. The region, the social movement in the region appeared on the radars of the media only when it moved to Egypt. Even Tunisia was not yet very much in December 2010, not much, not much very much in the news because Tunisia is a relatively marginal country. It's only in January when it became more dramatic that media attention was focused. But again, for those who study the region, as I do, uh, we, we can see this ongoing upheaval now as the result, the culmination of several years of turmoil, of uh, uh, social movements, political movements, social and political protest. In most countries of the region where this was possible, that is, except for the very, very repressive countries. Uh, if we take the two countries when the movement started, Tunisia and Egypt, in both countries there, has, there uh, have been several uh, instances of struggle over the last decade in Tunisia and in Egypt. You had a lot of social struggle, regional so social uh, fightings, Mine, the mining sector, uh, this or other social sector in Tunisia. Uh, in Egypt, between 2006 and 2009, the country has gone through its largest and deepest wave of working uh, worker strikes ever. The most important wave of worker strikes in the region, in, in, its hist in Egypt, in its history, between 2006 and 2009. So that this was announcing this big up upheaval, uh, you know, with the involvement of, of, uh, of hundreds of thousands, if not millions of workers in Egypt in strikes over 2006 and 2009, the wave of strikes is absolutely amazing. Uh, and political struggle, you have had the development in, in the two countries I mentioned, of a lot of political struggle, of uh, protest, uh, either related to the regional situation, like uh, uh, Western wars, uh, invasion of Iraq, for instance, or the Israel-Palestine conflict, uh, or related to local political issues, fight against the, the, the uh, dictatorship and for uh, freedom. So the ongoing upheaval was not a lightning in a blue sky. It was something that was uh, uh, preceded by a real intensification of the social and political struggle in some of the key countries of, uh, of, of the region. So in that sense, it was not surprising to have an explosion, an upheaval in the region. This said, no one could have expected that it would take this form. That is, what is really surprising is the scope, the extension, the form of the movement. 
what we social scientists or whatever were expecting were rather, you know, social explosions of the kind that is called bread riots or IMF riots that you have uh, in many uh, places. But this type of movement uh, with uh, a, a real, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, long-term perspective dedicated to overthrowing the government and going over days and days and days, and in some cases, months and months of, of mass uh, protest, this uh, is really a surprise to anyone. I mean, no one can claim that uh, he or she uh, had, um, uh, uh, I mean, had foreseen uh, the, uh, this, this type of event. Now, how can we explain here, again, for social scientists, we get immediately very much interested in studying the reasons of how can we explain this kind, this phenomenon in its originality. Had it been some usual type of explosion, it wouldn't have been uh, very uh, difficult to understand. But here we have something challenging uh, for interpretation. And this is very interesting. Now, what we could say, well, first of all, about the extension, the rapidity with which the movement spread to a whole linguistic area, because that's what you find. Uh, it's a geopolitical, but it's a linguistic area, Arab-speaking countries. Well, this is a clue to the reason of this extension. And actually, this extension is very much related to, I mean, two, fa two uh, factors. On the one hand, the structural uh, issues that I mentioned at the beginning, which the stalled development of the whole, the whole region. But <clears throat> so you had the, 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 the roots, the factors, explosive factors everywhere. All the countries of the region uh, face explosive conditions. It started in one country, Tunisia. Now it spread, as we have seen, like a, a wildfire over the whole region. One major, if not the major reason for this extension is, of course, the power of the example. And the first successful example in Tunisia, successful in toppling the president. But the power of the example can only be valid if people can see the example and see they could in the region in the most uh, primary meaning of seeing because of the new media technologies, new communication technology. And in that regard, satellite channels played a major role, especially Al Jazeera. You probably heard of it. But this media channel, which was the first major satellite channel in the Arab countries, it played a really a very crucial role in this uh, extension of the movement as we have seen it, because people could see what is going on and therefore get emboldened into uh, fighting uh, in, uh, uh, in their turn. And even in those countries like Syria, where <clears throat> the government prohibits the media, independent media, from covering what is happening, we have seen this mixture, this combination of social media and other uh, communication technology and the traditional big, the TV network, the satellite channel. YouTube was crucial in Syria. We see <clears throat> the images of what is happening in Syria through YouTube because people have, uh, you know, mobile phones, like so many people now, they can film what they see and they put it on YouTube and then 
It is on TV, that is, you can say, well, if it's only on YouTube, only those who have access to internet will see it. But what happens is that these networks, like Al Jazeera, they show what is on YouTube, and therefore, everybody see it, because as everywhere, as you know, uh, satellite dishes and the rest, uh, I mean, this has become part of the non-essential, uh, the essential non-food, sorry, uh, uh, items uh, that people uh, need to, or if you believe they need to have. So, that's one uh, uh, major uh, uh, feature which is very new. It is the first time in history that we see an extension over a linguistic or geopolitical area of a social movement due to modern communication technology. This is very interesting and there will be, I'm sure, a lot of, uh, of uh, reflection and study about that. Uh, the, 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 the second, uh, and also related to technology, is uh, the uh, social media, as they are called. I mean, to a certain degree, it was even exaggerated, especially in Western media, uh, by calling the events in the, in the region Facebook, Facebook revolutions. Uh, this is exaggerated, of course, because they are not only Facebook revolutions. But there is no doubt that uh, Facebook and such social media really played a very important role. I mean, I've been to very diverse countries in the region over the last few months, from Morocco to, to, uh, to, to, to Syria, I can say that everywhere you see the common feature of uh, the movement being called for and organized by networks using Facebook. You have this everywhere, in every country, almost every country there, this is uh, uh, used as a as a tool of, of organization. Now, where, where is the importance? The importance here is not, I mean, had the movement been organized by pre-existing forces like political parties or trade unions, you could say that Facebook is, or whatever, internet is secondary. But the key point here is that you have a whole new layer of people that emerge in these movements that it did not exist as a political subject. It did not exist as a political subject, it did not exist, it did not have any political agency. And suddenly, acquired agency went into motion through the use of these social media. This is completely new. This is completely new. Uh, and the, the, you have a whole layer of mostly young people uh, who have been exposed to, you know, world culture through the uh, internet, through communication technology, uh, television and the rest, who were longing for values like democracy and freedom. So we can call them liberal, but not in the social economic sense in the political sense, political liberalism, uh, democracy, freedom, and the rest, against the overwhelming power of the state, uh, with, you know, some longing for social justice. So it would be liberalism in the North American sense, in the US sense, that is, people who are relatively progressive. And this whole layer of people did not have previously any organization, they were just out of the political scene. And suddenly, thanks to these social media, they, they organized very, you know, I mean, relatively easily with these media, and therefore acquired, as I said, they acquired political agency and became main actors in the movements, in the upheavals everywhere. As from Morocco, again, to Syria, these Facebook networks are really playing a central role in organizing the movement. 
Now, of course, other pre-existing political forces joined the movement once it started. The most important forces in the region politically were, for the last few decades, due to reasons I don't have time to explain, but, I mean, the uh, historical defeat of the left, of uh, left-wing nationalism and the rest, uh, the, the dominant forces in the social protest and political protest have been, for the last decades, Islamic fundamentalist movements, religious movements. But almost everywhere, they did not initiate the protest. The protest was initiated rather by these layers that I mentioned, this Facebook uh, kind of uh, networks. And then other forces joined, joined uh, later. Uh, last point uh, before concluding is now that, I mean, I have mentioned a lot of factors that are common to the region, I will now get into differences between countries and therefore what is affecting the different dynamics of the movement in uh, each uh, country. Well, <clears throat> we, have, we, we can make distinction between cases. Tunisia and Egypt had a relatively similar uh, process. Both countries have actually gone into what we may call just stage one of a revolution. That's why <clears throat> I think it's more appropriate to speak of a revolutionary process in the region than a revolution, in the sense that it is unfinished. What uh, started in December 2010 in Tunisia is the beginning of a protracted historical process, really a so, uh, uh, historical epoch of, 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 so, of revolution uh, in, in the region. What happened in Tunisia and Egypt is that the strength of the mass movement was able to topple, topple the tip of the iceberg, only the tip of the iceberg, but the whole, the nine-tenths of the iceberg are, are there, underwater. The basic structure of the regime is still there in both countries, in Tunisia and Egypt. And that's why the social factor is still there. And even at the political level, uh, 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 th th there is more continuity than discontinuity, especially in Egypt, more so than in Tunisia, because in Tunisia the, the movement was deeper, at least at the level of the political change, the democratic change. In Egypt, even this level is uh, uh, limited because, as you can see, it's a, it's a military junta that is governing uh, Egypt. It's a military council, and therefore this represents very much the continuity of the regime. Uh, Mubarak himself is a product of the military apparatus. Egypt has been ruled by the military since the 50s, and they are still in power and they represent a huge force. They even represent 30% of the economy. The military sector represents 30%, 3-0% of the economy of, of Egypt because they have a lot of industries. They have a lot of, of uh, uh, you know, they are a, a big uh, trust, a huge trust, and they are still there. Now, <clears throat> in both countries, the working class has played a major role in the st uh, first stage. Both countries, Egypt and Tunisia, happen to be the two countries with the strongest working class movement in the whole region. With a difference, in Tunisia, the workers' movement is organized. You have the federation, the, uh, uh, Confederation of, uh, of Labour in Tunisia, and it has periodically 
play the role of opposition force. Not all the time, because the regime in Tunisia tried every now and then to, to control the unions. But every few years, in a recurrent uh, pattern, we see the union movement opposing the government. And in the, the, the tip, I mean, the turning point in the Tunisian uh, upheaval was when the union joined the movement and went into strikes and all that. And that was decisive in achieving stage one, getting rid of the president, the dictator, and his family and his cronies. But, as I said, I mean, that was only stage one, and the aspirations of the workers' movement are very far from being fulfilled. We can even see that more clearly in the case of Egypt. Now, in Egypt, there was no independent workers' movement. 